Well, good evening. I welcome you to this Ash Wednesday service, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will be with you and guide you as we begin this journey to the cross. Let us begin worship in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My friends, will you please stand and join me as we sing our opening hymn, Change My Heart, O God. may be seated. Lent is often known as a time of giving something up in order to make room in our lives for the spiritual pursuits. Rather than just giving up in Lent, the scriptures ask us to consider all that Jesus was up to and all that he asked us to be up to in his name. Instead of 
bemoaning what we can't do or what we used to do in a culture where measuring up to external standards seems impossible, this Lent we will celebrate the small things that we can do right now in this time and in this place. As we begin this Lenten season, we contemplate the essence and the substance of our lives. Do we spend time reaching for the things that we feel we must have, that our culture says that we need, or are we storing up things that bring us closer to God and the good things, the treasures that fill us and others with well-being of body, mind, and spirit? When I am down, and oh, my soul is weary, when troubles come, and my heart burden me, then I am still, and wait here in the sun. Till you come and sit a while with me, you raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. Friends, will you join me in our prayer tonight of confession? Merciful God, we come before you knowing that change must happen in our lives. But at times, facing those changes feels overwhelming. We feel the external expectations that distract and draw us into less important pursuits. In this moment of quiet, we lift up to you those things we would like to give up for good for the sake of the good. Let us go to the Lord in the silence of our heart. There is assurance that God will grant mercy and restore joy. Hear what the psalmist requests in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, God, according to your faithful love. Wipe away my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Wash me completely clean of my guilt. Purify me from my sin. Create a clean heart for me, God. Put a new faithful spirit deep inside me. Please don't throw me out of your presence. Please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Return the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me with a willing spirit. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will proclaim your praise. You don't want sacrifices. If I have an entirely burned offering, you wouldn't be pleased. A broken spirit is my sacrifice. You won't despise a heart that is broken and crushed. My friends, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven.
glory to God. Amen. And now I invite you, if you can, to please stand. And would you join us in the chorus that we just sang? As a people forgiven and freed, we reach out to lift others up, offering the peace of Christ. So peace be with you. And now I invite you to share that peace with the people sitting around you. My friends, as you make your way back to your seats, I ask that you would prepare your hearts to bring your, your offerings to the Lord, not just your monetary offerings, but also your gifts, your talents, and your witness.
let us pray. Gracious God, I dedicate these gifts to your kingdom work and my life to you as a living sacrifice, bringing all my actions under the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, come and fill your temple. Amen. You may be seated.
Will you join me in the prayer of illumination? Great spirit of wisdom, we desire to be reconciled to your will in this world. Remove any obstacles that would keep us from understanding your word. On this Lenten journey, guide our footsteps that we might follow the path of Christ to the cross. Amen. From the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue or in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in, at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to start my message off this morning with a poem by Mary Oliver uh, entitled, The Summer Day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaw back and forth instead of up and down who is gazing around with enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all, all, all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Does everything, doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? What do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? The, the question is ubiquitous, meaning it seems like it's everywhere. Um, this is a quote that is found on many things. It's been painted on T-shirts and mugs and, and posters. On its own, the question seems to challenge us to do something huge uh, and unique with our lives. But we, when we hear this question, um, after the entirety of Mary Oliver's poem, a poem that meanders through a summer day spending much time noticing the intricate details of a grasshopper. I wonder if that question might be a bit more complex, especially for those of us who live in this fast-paced, profit-driven, hectic life of today. More now than ever, humanity's in humanity's history, 
We are constantly bombarded with marketing and advertising campaigns that are incredibly effective and persuasive in, in shaping us and, and, and our behavior. This bombardment can cause us to feel shame and anxiety about what we buy or what we're supposed to buy. Um, you know, it, it makes us feel anxious about how productive we are and what our lives should look like. You know, these companies, they want us to um, think that we are not happy. We cannot be complete without their product, right? You know, the new iPhone 15 Pro with titanium. If you don't have that, you're nothing. Or, you know, maybe it's the latest Apple Watch or a streaming service, you know. You know, we, it, the, these companies, they make us feel ashamed if our lives don't look like the happy, bubbly people who just went out and bought a new Model 3 Tesla, you know. And maybe it's not that extravagant. Maybe it's just wanting some new clothes or a new lawn tractor, a new guitar. <laughs> or maybe, maybe it's just wanting to eat at some higher-end restaurants. The point is, we might be focusing on the wrong treasures, according to Jesus' teaching in Matthew 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. In modern times, maybe Jesus would add today, do not, uh, he might say, where moth and rust consume and your things become obsolete. I mean, don't you, doesn't it drive you crazy? You go out and you buy the, the newest, fastest computer, and within two weeks, they're already launching a newer, faster computer. Or, you know, you, before you even get your, your cell phone paid off, they're already advertising the next one. And, you know, things just become obsolete and unusable so much faster these days. And I don't think any of us are really immune from, from this drawing, uh, you know, uh, to treasures that we believe we're supposed to have or lives we're supposed to live or things that we're supposed to accomplish so that we can feel like we have value in this world. Mary Oliver asked the, the important question, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? But she asked an equally important question before that one. She said, I do know how to pay attention and how to fall down in the grass, how to kneel in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? You know, what else should I have done? What else should we be doing aside from this, this just constant pursuit after more, more things that seem, you know, all of us are urged to go after. What are the treasures that moths and rust can't, com can't consume? What are the things that don't become obsolete? In Psalm 51, the psalmist cries out to God, you don't want sacrifices. If I gave you the perfect burnt offering you wouldn't be pleased. A broken spirit is my sacrifice, God. You won't despise a heart that is broken and crushed. One thing that scripture reveals over and over again is that God desires from us things that are usually unexpected and often go beyond the cost of money and, and wealth. God doesn't, he doesn't want those things and he doesn't want our prayers if all they are are performances meant to impress people, um, to shape that, you know, what they think about us. For instance, we get a, a brand new car or we get that new iPhone or, you know, we, we, we go after the, the popular clothing, the new trends, just to impress people to, in hopes that they might like us that they might envy us and want what we have, that they, they might think that we're successful. However, what is it that God wants that we should be chasing? God wants a broken heart. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean he wants to break us, but he wants to redeem us. God wants us to have broken spirits, meaning God wants us to truly be sorry for the sin in our lives. God wants us to be 
he, he wants us to genuinely be taking steps to stop that, that sinning. And it doesn't, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter how good we look on the outside or, you know, the deeds that we do. If our hearts aren't right, if they're not repentant, then it's all worthless. A broken spirit is a humble spirit that knows that we are sinners, that knows we need a Savior, that knows we need God. God also desires our prayer. And our prayer is something that is precious to him, and it should be precious to us. And most often, it should be done in the confines of of this private conversation. Jesus said, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and out on the street corners to be seen by others. I tell you the truth, they have received their full reward. All they're going to get is that instant praise from someone oh look at him but then it's gone he says when you pray go into your room close the door and pray to your father in heaven then your father who sees what is done in private will reward you jesus taught that the essence of prayer is not for the world we don't pray to impress other people it it's not we don't you know if we're trying to just if we're using it to gain praise from people, then we've got it mixed up. We, we go to God in prayer and to get his praise. Prayer is to be this communal affair between us and God. Now, there is a place for corporate public prayer, but to pray only so that others hear and see us proves that our true audience isn't God. We're not praying to God when we do that. Mary Oliver says in her poem, I don't know exactly what a prayer is. And I found that interesting um, because there is nothing else that seems to be religious in this poem and yet the whole thing has religion written all over it. And maybe I'm reading too much into her and you know, what she's trying to convey, but all indication is that she is alone, contemplating life and creation, especially, you know, the, the, the details of this grasshopper that has landed on her hand. And she watches it and describes it intricately. And then out of nowhere, she just says, I don't know exactly what prayer is. But then she goes on to kind of describe it, I think, at least the way I, I was reading it. She's alone, contemplating the world, creation, life, And then says, I don't know exactly what prayer is, but I do know, I do know how to pay attention. She knows that she she sees things around her. She sees the created world. She sees the details of it. And she, she sees what is true. She sees what is right. She sees what is needed. She knows how to fall down, to kneel in the grass, as if to pray. She knows how to be idle and blessed. As the psalmist said, be still and know that I am God. And she knows how to stroll through the fields. In essence, is she walking with God? I come to the garden alone and he walks with me and he talks with me. And this is what she's been doing all day. Spending time perhaps, in prayer with God. And she says, what else should I have been doing? You know? And then the closing question. What is it you plan to do with your life? Will you spend it with a walk with God too? And God longs for these things from us because God wants us to be whole. He, he desires a broken spirit and a broken heart, but not a broken person. God desires for us to do the things that restore us rather than the things that keep the holes within us wide. And we're constantly trying to fill them with things that truly will not satisfy us. 
God hopes for us to be content, to delight in the abundance that is right for us, rather than to live pointlessly striving for things that truly will never last. For the things that never last will rust and and disintegrate into dust and ash, like the ash that we will put on our foreheads this night as we begin Lent. So Mary Oliver is right. Perhaps one of the most important things we can be up to this Lent is something that keeps us centered on who we are, where God has placed us, and and what abundance God is putting in front of us each day. And maybe the way that we stay centered is to spend time with God every day during Lent, kneeling down in the grass and and being quiet and idle and just walking with God through the fields of life for what else should we be doing all day? Amen? Amen. In preparation for the imposition of ashes, let us hear the words of Psalm 141, verses 1 and 2. I call upon you, O Lord. Come quickly to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you, and the lifting of my hands as an evening sacrifice. The imposition of ashes on Ash Wednesday is a Christian tradition implemented in the 11th century when Ash Wednesday was added to the liturgical calendar. The reference to ashes as part of the tradition of of penitence was connected with wearing sackcloth in the book of Daniel. In those early days of marking Ash Wednesday, those who had been ousted from the church for doing something wrong or not living a right life, they had been uh, pushed out of the church, they would wear sackcloth and ash all through Lent until they rejoined the church on Monday, Thursday and participated in Holy Communion with, with the faithful. We don't push people out of the church much anymore. We are all in need of reconnection with divine love and our church is a place where Mercy is the order of the day. But on Ash Wednesday, we remember that, folks, we are not mythical gods. We are not perfect, and we will not live forever. So this year, we commit to making the most out of our one precious life by being up to something good. Rather than give something up, this year, we'll focus on the little things that lift up our lives and the lives of people around us. Like incense that the psalmist writes about in one, Psalm 141. Even the smallest actions of our lives can elevate us all to a higher place of love and mercy and justice. These then are the treasures that, that we will store up. So let our ashes this night remind us of how precious our time is on this earth. Let my prayers be counted as incense before you, and by the lifting of my hands be an evening sacrifice. This time, I invite you to come, come and receive the ashes.
Will you pray with me? Author of the cosmos, of the universe, our view of this world is so limited. But you create and you see and know all. May our life practices be used in ways that reverberate to the edges of whatever possibility there is, that they may be treasures in heaven multiplied on earth through your love. Amen. And now, would you please stand and join me in our closing hymn, Take Up Thy Cross. as you leave here tonight remember the words of our Lord to beware practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them the sackcloth, the ash that we wear is not something to go out and brag about it is meant to humble us to remind us that we are sinners and we will go back to the, to, to the dust however our hope is in Christ who we rise with. And so now go into the world knowing that there are treasures all around waiting to be amplified and lifted up. May this season be one of soaring with the Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ and in the love and mercy of, of the Creator. So when someone asks you, what are you up to this, these 40 days? You can say, with the help of God, I'm up to something good. Amen? Amen. Amen.